Uh, I'm the Marine Protected Areas Coordinator for the Mi'kmaq Rights Initiative. We're also called the KMKNL. We were created to oversee negotiations and consultation processes between the Mi'kmaq of Nova Scotia, the province, and the government of Canada. We're governed and receive our mandates from the Assembly of Nova Scotia and Mi'kmaq Chiefs, and collectively we work on broader nation issues for the Mi'kmaq of Nova Scotia. Uh, this is developed in collaboration with DFO and other Mi'kmaq organizations. The webinar series focuses on those IPCAs, specifically which pertain to marine environments, of which we will cover parts tonight. UNIR, which is the Unamagi Institute of Natural Resources, they represent the five Mi'kmaq communities on Cape Breton Island, Nova Scotia. They were formed to ensure the sustainable use and production of natural resources while still maintaining Unamagi Mi'kmaq traditions and worldviews. They have been absolutely instrumental in both the previous IPCA webinar series, which you can find on YouTube, that are a little bit broader based, and with this series. So I'd like to say thank you to all of you guys uh, from UNIR who are joining us tonight. I'd also like to mention CMM, the Confederacy of Mainland Mi'kmaq. It's a nonprofit that works to proactively promote and assist Mi'kmaq communities initiatives towards self-determination and enhancement of community, and it supported this series in full. So again, thank you guys so, so much. I also want to recognize the contributions of Oceans North. Of course, they support marine conservation in partnership with Indigenous and coastal communities, and their contributions to this webinar series has been greatly, greatly, greatly appreciated. Thank you so much, Susanna and everyone. So on behalf of all of us, we just want to begin by introducing our amazing Mi'kmaq elder, Albert Marshall. He's from the Moose Clan of the Mi'kmaq Nation. He lives in Eskazoni and Unamagi, which is Cape Breton in English. He's a fluent Mi'kmaq language speaker, a passionate advocate of cross-cultural understanding and healing, and a designated voice for the Mi'kmaq elders of Unamagi in respect to environmental issues. He's a spouse, a father, a grandfather, a great-grandfather, and I'm told from other webinars that you're also a friend of many. We're really happy to have you here, and I'd like to turn it over to Albert to lead us through an opening prayer. Thank you very much for having me. Tonight, tonight we're going to ask for guidance and strength because i think it's becoming it should become obvious to all of us that our relationship with the land is broken and it's about time that we get back get back to our inherent responsibilities Akadamula <laughs> Again, <laughs> Thank you so much, Albert. That means a lot to us that you were here. Um, in this calm, I'm going to speak slower and I just want to cover some quick housekeeping. So for those of you who aren't used to webinars like me, please keep your cameras and your microphones off during the presentation. Any questions or comments, we would love to hear them. Please just make them in the chat box and they'll be addressed afterwards in the Q&A portion. 
Uh, we do have a door prize this evening. It's a beautiful piece of stone pottery that incorporates sweetgrass. It's created by Nancy Oakley, who lives and works in here in Escazoni, so in Nova Scotia and Cape Breton. Uh, the presentation, as Heidi mentioned, will be recorded and it will be released at a later date on YouTube to accompany the previous series on IPCAs that have a broader, broader focus. The Q&A session specifically will not be made public afterwards, so we really hope for a respectful and an enticing discussion period following our presentations. Um, to get started with the actual presentation, I'd like to introduce our facilitator uh, for this evening and for this series of webinars, uh, Dr. Heidi Vigan. Uh, Dr. Vigand is an assist assistant professor in management with Dalhousie University who focuses on leadership development, systematic discrimination, and resil resiliency. She has extensive experience working with First Nations leaders and communities with a passion for cultivating self-governance practices and sustainable communities. Heidi is a certified Lean Six Sigma Black Belt. She served on a variety of boards and is often invited to speak on the topics of leadership and developing a contagious, innovative mindset in others. Heidi's current research studies include intergenerational perceptions of kindness related to COVID-19 and Black Lives Matter in Canada, Europe, and Africa, analyzing pharmaceutical roles and practices during COVID-19, and to explore quality, diversity, and inclusion practices in nursing roles for long-term care and continuing care homes. So we're really happy to have you here, Heidi. I'm really grateful for your help tonight. Thank you so much, and I'll let you take it away. Thank you very much, Beck. And we were uh, um, sharing that it is 2022, and we already have a few technology clips, so we seem to be on par with every other year. So uh, we welcome everybody um, to the session, and thank you very much for the introduction. Um, and as people are coming in, I'm also admitting them, but I'm just going to um, introduce our two wonderful speakers for tonight. And I would, uh, I'm not sure that I would call you speakers as much as storytellers and entertainers, because I've already engaged with you a little bit through the, the dialogue as we were entering in. So I'll go through your bios um, and, uh, and then we'll get started into the heart of the conversation today. So Lawrence Martin is an accomplished musician and Juno winner for best music of Aboriginal Canadian recording. He's made a history as, a first as the first Aboriginal person in Ontario elected to lead a non-Native municipality. Then he made the history again by becoming one of the only people in Canada elected to lead two different municipalities. Lawrence is a member of the Muskegee First Nation, is, is currently the Muskegee um, Council's Marine Conservation Manager. And he came into this role after being elected as the Muskegee um, Grand Chief twice. Vern, um, and I hope that I get this right, Vern uh, Chichu is a Moose Creek First Nation member. He is a singer, songwriter, and holds multiple nominations for Junos, Saskatchewan Country Music Association Awards, and a winner with the Aboriginal Music Awards. He is a member of the Society of Composers, Authors, and Publishers of Canada and now, and Director of the Lands and Resources at um, Muskegawak uh, Council. Each year, Vern must handle negotiations with the government ministries to maintain funding for his uh, program and staff. And over his lifetime, Vern says he has seen rapid changes to the ecosystems in Northern Ontario. And he says First Nations um, have had to adjust. So um, I'm going to now um, turn it over to Vern. I believe you're gonna be sharing your screen to put the presentation up. Um, and for the purposes mm -hmm. of everybody, there are a couple of videos and uh, Vern and Lawrence are going to help us along with narrating those um, because we can't quite hear them here, but we'll be putting them into the chat box as well. All right, so Vern. Great, thank you. Uh, thank you and uh, happy to be a uh, part of this and to uh, share our uh, bit of our story and what we're doing and the work that we're doing. Uh, I want to wish everybody a happy new year first <laughs> and I'll share the screen of the um, presentation. Okay, can everybody see that? Mm -hmm. It's all there. Okay. Yeah. So we'll start the slideshow from the beginning. We can get this going. Yep, there we go. And um, so um, I'm going to be doing the uh, first part of this uh, PowerPoint presentation, and then we'll hand it over to uh, Lawrence to do the marine region. So we're looking at two regions here, the uh, terrestrial region, uh, which is the um, the, the wetlands of Meshkegwak, 
a territory and the marine region. And these are our initiatives from uh, uh, <clears throat> that we are following up on. Um, the elders called the Muskate wetlands the breathing lands because they are the lungs of the earth, preserving the watersheds, keep keeps carbon and methane reserves safely locked up and out of the atmosphere. The Lands and Resources Department continues to work towards the protection of the environment within the Muskego territory as the priority identified in 2013 engagement project on the Ring of Fire. I'm not sure if uh, you folks know, but uh, there's a region west of our territory uh, that's that's looked at uh, by the Ontario government uh, to develop uh, a mining uh, region called the Ring of Fire. And it's about a kilometer in diameter. Um, I mean, sorry, 100 kilometers in diameter region of mining that could last 150 to 200 years. So um, in our because we're out of the territory of that uh, the uh, where the ring of fire is situated part of it is actually um, uh, within a traditional territory of one of our communities so we we did a uh, engagement project with the people to see you know what their stance was on the um on the ring of fire and our past uh, grand chief um uh, Jonathan Solomon's uh, top priority when he came into office was pr the protection and conservation of our lands and waters that have long provided us as a nation. And the same was uh, found when the uh, community uh, pro uh, project, engagement project uh, back in 2013 as the environment uh, is the top priority. So this is what gives us our mandates to go forward. And back in uh, uh, 2019, there was a resolution on the development of a regional strategy on climate change that was passed by the uh, um, annual General Assembly um, attendance, you know, at, in at Wabasket, in one of our communities along the west coast of James Bay. And there was also in the past, uh, back in 1989, a resolution on the establishment of a Muskegua Conservation Authority. And so the, the, that's the kind of, um, you know, uh, mandates that we have that have been, you know, been told to us over the years as to what, uh, uh, what we needed to do in terms of protection, protection of our region. And I'm going to show this uh, video um, right now. And this is the end. That means that they keep here much gas can get to the height of the height of carbon. Yeah, no, I know it's the one. Was it the case now? We don't care. I guess you know, I got the scumic. Mona, Mona, keep it going. And he had to get to you. You have to know how to much gas key. Munusago Gine in the Nog, Catasi Hetic. Skin the book, which you must take to meet the number one, your go, Muskega Skia, as he started. Stirs Catasi Gauchis talking on about carbon, a good tanny. Kistimista, he happy, a decent so. A good tanny, James Ray, Mr. Manga, Hudson's Bay. A ski in the Nog. No, Mr. Nanaku Yashisa, a good tennis, but is it a case in the Naku now, Mr. Minosa Kaski? A tick, Kiko Hagil, a mess, Mr. Nanaku Penesisa. One of the days of the Punish Tapas with South America. Muskego, which we might to Hagil, the woman or skin of Gash Minosa, Mr. Natumichi Moschi. Canada, this two maski, one of the gear to stomach, I guess it in the Hector and I stand on Husky. He got gone to Mr. Boba take easy to the near and pupon to pupon a gag. The natusta was a tea that the animal to get the old okay gone. 
Kõikiks tutumun, tegesi ma näetis täinu äski. Käis see nende ma pestad tähek äski. So that's the, the video. The wetlands is a huge area within uh, the Hudson James Bay lowlands. Um, <clears throat> and is said to be the largest in North America, uh, the third largest in the world, and said to contain the second largest carbon sink in the world. So it's a significant region that our elders call the breathing lands of Mother Earth. Climate change is impacting this region as we experience more winter rains, uh, shorter season, for winter road systems impacting on food security. Early thaw this past spring affected the spring goose hunt. Uh, in, and normally we're, we're out there uh, hunting geese in the, um, in the month of April. And uh, normally there's a lot of snow, you know, at that time. And this past spring, um, by the time we were out there, there was very little snow and uh, you know a lot of it had melted because we were getting warm warm temperatures and um you know lawrence and i were out there in our blind hunting geese and the uh, you know and there was a temperature of 20 to 22 degrees above you know which is not normal for that time of the year for us and so um <clears throat> a lot of the people in the north um were affected by the spring, by this um, uh, this change in weather, and in the words of one of the uh, uh, elders in Atawabasket, Ignis Gull said, "Many freezers sit empty today because of the hunt was very poor." So we used to see tens of thousands of blue geese, you know, white white heads we call them, and snow geese in the southern regions of, of James Bay. And this no longer happens. Um, you know, and um, the rivers in the summer months are very shallow, making it difficult to go fishing and hunting moose in these regions. We see more and more people going south by train to hunt moose uh, in the fall within the forested regions of southern um, uh, southern uh, or uh, you know south of the the James Bay region, so they end up uh, driving around uh, with vehicles in the um, um, forested areas uh, to hunt to hunt moose because they can't access their territories up north because of the um, the lack of water in the summertime or in the fall. We have known that changes have been happening now for some time. Ptarmigans that used to be plenty in the bear area, in the bay area as well, have gone elsewhere. We, we don't see those anymore. Uh, we are seeing more polar bears uh, in the southern region of James Bay, which never happened before. So, you know, there, there's, um, um, they're coming as far as south of Moose Factory and never has that ever happened you know um they've come to our um our um uh waste disposal dump you know um waste uh waste site where the um polar bears are coming down they're hungry and they're looking for food because they can't no longer get that in uh within the bay area uh because of the melt of the ice and that so and so we have called on support to bring attention to this region. Uh, industry in large part is responsible for the climate change impacts. The federal government, of course, we, you know, we know has set mandates to protect and serve 25% of Canada's lands and oceans by 2025 and 30 by 30. There is growing interest in protecting and conserving the wetlands region in Northern Ontario. And we are working collaboratively, collaboratively with NGOs and foundations to help fund our initiatives, both in the marine region and within the terrestrial region. 
Woodlands and Boreal Taurus. So the partners and supporters that um, uh, we have working with us is uh, Metcalf Foundation, Hewlett Packard, Wildlands League, World Wildlife Fund Canada, Wildlife Conservation Society, the Makeway Foundation, and several staff from these organizations and scientists are assisting in this conservation effort. And um, so there, there, there is, uh, if you look at this map, um, <clears throat> here's the James Bay and the Hudson Bay up this, this region here. So, and um, the purple part here is, is the wetlands region. And um, this is the ring of fire potential development that I'd mentioned is about a kilometer a uh, 100 kilometers in radius and there's an access road that's that's you know they're hoping to build to connect the ring of fire to the highway 11 corridor and so you can see that that development is slowly creeping up towards this um, this wetlands region and uh, you know we're we're um we're we're wanting to protect this region because of its significance and what it does as a carbon, you know, um, it, it sequesters um, huge amounts of carbon and um, this uh, development is a potential risk, a threat to it. So um, the threat of, uh, you know, the disturbance of peatland uh, could have this region become a source of greenhouse gases you know, if, if they're not careful in how they uh, they work within this region. So we're fighting to uh, um, to keep this area and region uh, protected. We have a carbon mapping project. Uh, some of the work that we're doing as well. Um, you know, the with uh, in partnership with the World Wildlife Fund Canada the rapid release of carbon dioxide in our atmosphere from direct conversion and degradation of land has led to loss of key habitats for species and to unpredictable and warming global climate. By maintaining and protecting our natural carbon sinks and stocks, we can begin to address these dual global environmental crises. WWF Canada Meshkewak will build the foundational research that is required to inform and catalyze conservation planning and sustainable development strategies for the Hudson James Bay lowlands. We aim to systematically sample peatland carbon and in inventory coastal habitats in the Hudson James Bay lowlands to create new understanding of where important carbon storage areas exist in the region and where opportunities may exist for future conservation efforts. As you can see in this map, um, these are some of the sites that we're, uh, we're looking at. Um, they've all been chosen um, um, <clears throat> from uh, the Moose Cree to Albany, Saskatchewan, Atawabasket and Pewanik are the sites that uh, have been chosen um, to do sampling. Uh, the sampling is going to begin next uh, next summer, uh, as this summer was, um, you know, uh, impacted by the COVID, uh, um, and uh, we were unable to visit uh, these communities to do those sampling. But this is uh, the map of those areas that were chosen. Uh, the Natasquinan Conservation Project is supported by Wildlife Conservation Society of Canada. Metcalf Foundation and Hewlett Packard. Um, the project is to work with communities through support of community coordinators that will help with engagement. And so uh, the terrestrial manager um, <clears throat> has not yet been identified, even though it says it has been identified. Uh, we're still going through the, the uh, uh, hiring process on this. We had a delay um, so we had to uh, wait until um, um, <clears throat> this next week to do uh, our uh, selection of, uh, uh, of an individual that will lead the terrestrial um, project. 
Um, so uh, Lawrence will have a, a, you know, a, a co-manager, I guess, um, working side by side as the terrestrial and the marine manager. Um, so that's that's coming. So um, and then identifying supporting each community's areas for protection, IPCAs. Um, each community has identified their own areas in which we want to be able to uh, work with them and help them and support them in uh, ensuring that these IPCAs are, are uh, recognized and confirmed um, <clears throat> under the, uh, the government's, um, this right now, the, the law does not protect them and we have to find ways on how we can secure that. Uh, the climate adaptation project, um, which is funded by uh, CERNAC, the um, <clears throat> uh, Canada's Indigenous Relations, um, uh, <clears throat> and, uh, uh, used to be INAC. Um, anyways, uh, the wetlands plays a major role in the greater James Hudson Bay complex. The wetlands are home to five are home to five of the seven Meshkegwa communities, including Winas First Nation. Uh, very little is known about the current and future potential impacts of climate change on this globally important region. The climate adaptation within the traditional lands, the Meshkegwa project is a three-phase project with the ultimate goal of a concrete adaptation planning for the communities. We have completed phase one of this three phase project. We have completed literature review on the science information that is available to us. Not a lot is known of the region. The collection of traditional knowledge to help inform the next steps in phase two and three. Work closely with elders from the communities to help guide the project and give their advice. Uh, the other thing that uh, we're trying to do is, uh, is you know, to have uh, Ramsar, the uh, wetlands um, recognized under the convention of uh, the wetlands, um, <clears throat> the Ramsar Convention, the intergovernmental treaty that provides the framework of national action and international cooperation for the conservation and wise use of wetlands and their resources. So we're working to get um, this recognized under the uh, Ramsar Convention. It's a, a work in progress. There's still a lot of uh, work that needs to be done um, to get this uh, designation. Uh, existing and proposed uh, studies that we've done, uh, we have completed six years of aquatic terrestrial baseline studies on all the rivers on the west coast, the James Bay, and including the Winnes River along the Hudson Bay. We are proposing to begin monitoring these rivers before any development should take place in the Ring of Fire region. Studies are being proposed, led by a Wildlife Conservation Society of Canada on beetlands in which we are a partner want to find the carbon and biodiversity co-benefits of the Hudson Bay lowland. We have an interest in ensuring that the globally significant ecological, social, and economic values of the freshwater systems within the Natasquinan Hudson Bay lowlands are recognized, valued, and maintained. We are also working in partnership with the University of Western Science to study chromium-6 it is a lethal form of chromium that could get into the rivers and into the food chain, food chain if not properly handled. And now I'm going to hand it over to uh, Lawrence to do the uh, marine uh, conservation. Okay, Lawrence. Okay, Nivaj. Kibetun. Kibetuna. I don't hear you. Is anybody out there? We're here. Okay. Hi. Okay. Hi. All right. Oh, everybody's here. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. Thanks, Vern. As you can see uh, from what Vern has described, there's a lot of work we've been doing as Meshkegwa people in our area. 
all to try and uh, and save our our planet and save our region for sure. And I I really like what you said at the beginning, Albert, when you said you know uh, connecting connection to the land has been broken, and it's time to get back to our responsibilities. I really like that because I think that's that's the basis of what we are doing here at Meshkegwak as well. And we watch, you know, what's going on in the country and certainly trying to tap into the timing of things that are going on. You know, when the federal government started announcing the conservation efforts, like Byrne mentioned, 2025 to be 25%, 30% by 2030. When that opportunity was being made public, our chiefs got together and talked about it. And right away, they, uh, they put a support resolution together to get us to start mapping that out what that's going to look like so a letter was sent to the minister of environment saying that Meshkegel was interested in this in this effort and right away they responded and uh, next thing you know we're starting to talk about the project and we were able to get some funding from various foundations to get us started because as you know uh, it takes a while to get funding to flow from the governments so we were able to get started, get rolling, get our planning in place under foundation's money. And what we went after was this uh, Marine Conservation Area, National Marine Conservation Area, NMCA is what they call it. So we opted in to, uh, to set this up to do a feasibility study in a James Bay in Hudson Bay. As you would note there, Weenie Bay is a Cree name for James Bay. And Wash Bay, Wash Bay is the Hudson Bay. These are the Cree names. And again, part of our thinking is we want to get back to our language, our Cree language, and start taking all those English names of all the places that have been given by people who came to settle in Canada. We want to bring those Cree names back. And that's part of what we're doing, why we're trying to uh, rename these places. And we feel what we are doing, you know, is part of our regaining our culture and regaining control of the lands and the waters and to acknowledge that all of this has been sustaining us and that we have a very interconnected ecosystem that needs to be uh, um, paid attention to, it needs to be protected so that it will keep sustaining all the future generations. And uh, this map here, you'll see the James Bay and see different colored lines on it. The Western side of uh, the map here, James Bay and Hudson Bay, this is the Meshkegwa territory. On the eastern side is the Quebec uh, EU, the Quebec Crees, and further north is the Inuit uh, people. So there's a number of different people that are in the James Bay and Hudson Bay that we want to work with in making sure that all of this area, all these two bays are protected by the indigenous people, and that's where we want to go. So, uh, and knowing that Parks Canada, you know, has that mandate to uh, to protect and conserve uh, Canada's waters and lands, so this is the, what what we have opted to jump into by working with Parks Canada, and uh, we established this uh, this uh, this movement from our communities and from our leadership to to uh, look at utilizing this feasibility study format that and to establish an MCA requires, and to look at doing this on a James Bay and a Hudson Bay area. And we feel by working together with Canada, you know, at the end of the feasibility study period, which is gonna be two years, plus uh, another year for negotiations, I guess much of what you guys are doing right now here in your organization, you mentioned your Beck, we will be getting into the negotiations in, in the third year in the hopes of having a co-management agreement with Canada. And at the same time, being able to do all of these various studies on the conservation and to be able to reach this, uh, this agreement and to reach the awareness that people need to have of what is here, what is it that we're trying to uh, protect and what kind of mitigation plans that we need to have on, on the climate change itself and possibly any other kind of disturbance that may come from industry and so forth. And, and our big focus is um, community engagement, which is at the heart of this project. So we have uh, budgeted a lot of time, a lot of money in, in, into the consultation of our communities 
to acquire that traditional knowledge from the elders, from the land users, from the knowledge holders. So we're just beginning to do that now, identifying timelines. But as, uh, as mentioned before, because of COVID, we haven't been able to travel much in the last six months. So we're utilizing media like this, social media, and having virtual conferences whenever we can to talk to the elders and they share their stories that way. So that we, uh, we understand what the project is and then we understand that we need to talk to the people who are willingly able to share their knowledge with us. This is a short little video that we have. Is it part of this, Bern? Is it on here? This is the MOU signing that took place on August the 9th in Moose Factory. We have to speak for the environment because the environment can't speak for itself. This MOU is a vehicle to study and assess the conditions of the waters of the base. We look forward to a more promising future for ourselves, the elders that are still here with us, but also to our children. We want them to have a better experience. We want, we want them to have a better life. We have a very long path to travel on reconciliation in this country. But every day we dip our paddle in the water, we begin to close the distance. We must work to transform historic relationships between Indigenous and non-Indigenous communities. And we must similarly strive to transform our relationship with the natural world to a nature positive carbon neutral future. We have received numerous letters of support across the country from regular Joes congratulating Mashkego Cree nations on their endeavor to protect their homelands and waters. Grand Chief uh, Jonathan, Minister Jonathan, with the Jonathans in the room, please stand up. <laughs> Again, it's really important to document this moment. As we force forward on this very important work, let us not look at ourselves, but rather let's consider and think about our children and grandchildren and their children. It is our responsibility to safeguard, protect their culture, our culture, tradition, and livelihood. So. so this was August the 9th in Moose Factory. There was a signing that took place there. And we wanted it to be in Moose Factory for a political reason as well. Not only is it uh, one of our communities, but we also have Moose Factory as one of the, uh, I guess, the first settled white community in, in Canada over th almost 350 years now. It'll be 350 years in, in uh, 2023. So we wanted there to kind of make that statement. It's been a long time, but you know, as, uh, as Albert said, you know, it's, it's time to get back to our responsibilities. So this is what we were saying in having this ceremony there. And of course, it's really important to have this, this event. And we had it broadcast on our Wawate Cree radio. And we had a number of people we broadcast it live on, a, on the internet on the live stream as well. So we try to cover as much ground as we can to, uh, to hold the government accountable to this commitment, knowing that there was an election just a week before this, this period. So uh, we had to rush everything and make sure this commitment was gonna carry through no matter which government came in. But at first, I guess the liberals did get back in, but we didn't get uh, Jonathan uh, Wilkinson back. So uh, we established a, uh, a, uh, this group of people here. One of them is me, one of them is Bernie. You have to guess which one. 
these are the different partners that we have from the NGOs. Plus, we also have what's called a, uh, a task force. The task force is basically a, like our board of directors that kind of oversee the project on behalf of the communities. Each person is appointed by the, uh, the chief and council. So what we are doing right now is uh, working towards finalize, finalizing the contribution agreement. And we will be able to start the feasibility studies. And then we'll have to start looking at hiring a chief negotiator for the establishment agreement that's gonna start on the third year of this project. And we always work with partners and it's been, been able to get from ground zero to different levels. And as mentioned before, we have the Gordon Betty Moore Foundation from the US, World Wildlife Fund Canada, Environment Funders Canada, Oceans Collaborative, Oceans North, Wetlands League, Oceans Five, and there's other funders. We also uh, were able to get some money from, from the US. And also in this partnership, we have Parks Canada, of course. And we have developed the Meshkegwakmarine.ca website. So that this is where we'll be able to host a lot of our information as we gather the information from the communities on what areas to protect, what kind of stories we wanna be able to put on there so that everything is digitized and it's, it's stored in a hub, in a, in a database uh, system. So everything will be done with the technology and acquiring the information is done with the technology as well. So these are the things that we're gonna be looking at doing. And you know the TEK, the traditional ecological knowledge, the scientific studies, the community engagement process, chief meeting reports and AGAs, the steering committee and reports, hiring local coordinators, task force members, GUCOM Council, that's the Elder Women Council, and our communications plan to work with uh, all different types of media, social media and the tools and the different announcements and so forth. And we also have partnerships with the University of Manitoba. So this summer they came in from Churchill, uh, Manitoba. They sailed from there and came down to the James Bay area and set up a whole bunch of different studies to take a look at what's in the bay, what type of fauna do we have, what type of uh, other life is there that we can actually take a look at, including the salinity of the water and the different mammals that we find there. So it's, it's, it's a huge undertaking. So this information was uh, put together this, this past summer. And then next summer, they'll be going back in and checking all of these test equipment that they put into the water to see what's, what's there. And this is the crew from the uh, University of Manitoba and also members of Oceans North and I believe uh, wildlife, uh, I don't know if there's any wildlife people there, but Definitely is part of our partnerships that we have. And we say miigwech in our language, say thank you. So this is basically the beginning of what we've been uh, working on for the last little while. And just making sure that we have all of the, the funds in place to do the work. It's a, it's a $6 million budget for three years. We're able to get half of that from Parks Canada and the other half from the, uh, the various foundations that I mentioned. So there you go. Wonderful, thanks. We're gonna now move into a piece where we're going to have an opportunity to have some dialogue amongst everybody. I'm going to actually turn the recording off at this point and say thank you very much.